मैं तुमसे प्यार करती है आई लव यू शी सेस वाउ शी लाइज बीटन ब्रूज एंड लाइन ऑन द फ्लोर मैं तुमसे प्यार करती है द फेरी टेल वाज वेयरिंग द रेड लेंगा गोल्ड नेकलेस एंड मेंडी ऑन हर हैंड्स येट हिज फैमिली ब्लेड हर मनी ड्राई demanding large dairy gold and cash we, we want, want more. more we, we want, want more, more. There, there was, was no, no end, end to the, to the greed main tumse pyar karti hai she says when he makes her watch porn rapes her every night satisfying his own sexual desires while she lays in bed from the pain and bleeding He refuses to take her to the doctor. Main tumse pyar karti hai. I don't love you. You are ugly, fat, and a terrible cook. Dumb and stupid. She tries every day to please her husband. Yet he comes home angry, frustrated, and kicks her like a punching bag. Main tumse pyar karti hai. How can I tell you my story when I don't speak your language? Who can I call? Where can I get help? What will my family say? What will happen to me? Main tumse pyar karti hai. My life is over. Who will love me? How can I stand on my feet when I hurt all over? My heart is broken. My dreams are shattered. Main tumse pyar karti hai. I love you. She says. Um, originally, I was planning to show that at the end, but Viji said to um, show it at the beginning. So um, uh, I'll tell you the backstory a bit later on. Um, I'm very happy and, and honoured to be here today in uh, very wet California. I'm from Australia, so it is 36 degrees heat in summer and. Um, Yes, the 20 degree temperature drop has been a bit of an adjustment. Um, I'm a social worker, so um, the video that you just saw before um, is actually a poem that I wrote, based on all the, um, unfortunately, all the victims that I have worked with and have supported over a number of years. So um, today's presentation. Um, firstly, I'm just going to because I, I am a Sikh and I'm a Tamil Sikh, so I will first talk about um, the perspectives from the Sikh faith um, around gender equality, and then also then what are the issues and challenges faced by Indian women. So I'm assuming most people know this, but I feel it, it is still very important, given that we are going to celebrate the 550th uh, celebration of Guru Nanak Dev Ji this year, and um, I feel it that it is absolutely essential that we, you know, really understand the true message and actually re-examine, um, reawaken some of those key. Uh, scriptures, key um, shabads, um, particularly around um, the empowerment of women. So Guru Nanak Dev Ji, he was a reformer, he was a visionary, um, and this shabad is actually in the Asaviwar. So um, the key pangti that gets used in our um, literature is around Sokya Manda Akiya Jit Jamme Rajan. So you know why should we call her? Ill, Ill, Ill of her when she gives birth to kings, so I want you to keep that concept in your mind as we go through the slides. Um, and 
you know, to reminisce about what was a key message of Guru Nanak Dev Ji and where we are today in 2019. Human rights of women. So the Sikh Gurus, you know, from Guru Nanak Dev Ji right through to Guru Gobind Singh Ji actively promoted and spoke out against social practices that existed within India and Indian culture um, at that time. So one of the key practices that occurred was the practice of sati, which is widow burning. So um, a woman who became a widow, um, it was assumed that her life had no value. So she was expected to um, lie next to her deceased husband on the funeral pyre. So because that was the expectation, without a man, without a husband, you have no value. So Guru Amar Das Ji wrote this Shabbat, um, Satya Ena Akhien Jo Marie Lage Jalan, Nanak Satya Janye Je Bare Chot Maran. Do not call them Sati who burn themselves along with their husband's corpses. O Nanak, they alone are known as Sati who die from the shock of separation. So some of the more contemporary domestic violent cases that I've seen have included husbands burning their wives. So that to me illustrates that this cultural practice is still embedded within Indian culture despite um, our Sikh Guru speaking out about it 550 years ago. So. The dowry system, and I will go into a bit more detail, but the dowry system existed for centuries and it still exists. But if you are a practicing Sikh and you follow the, the Sikh scriptures, then you will be mindful then about what our Sikh gurus actually speak about some of these cultural practices that exist. So I won't go into all the wording of the Shabbat because it is on the screen. But the key message of this Shabad, but written by Guru Ram Das Ji, is that um, the display of wealth is a, a show of manmuk, ego, and it is not according to the Sikh principles of humility. So, you know, showing that off is falsehood. And, you know, we should be actually incorporating um, the love for God and actually embedding those principles as part of the wedding gift. So clearly in the Guru Granth Sahib, we have key Shabads that actually instruct us that this is what um, our Gurus had envisaged for us. So this is a, a, a slide that I use in um, a lot of my workshops that I deliver to professionals in trying to help them understand what is a dowry system. So because most of you here are Punjabi Sikh, I probably don't need to go into too much detail. But typically, the dowry means that the bride's family, if you look at this caption, um, there's an expectation. So whether the groom's family wants a car, a motorbike, furniture, gold, jewelry, cattle, television, um, that's the bride's father who's sweating it out. And then the groom's father is saying, no, no, we just want regular drinking water, which is not the reality. So the bride is expected um, and the bride's family is expected to give all of this. Um, and I will talk a bit later about some of the um, real challenges that a lot of women have faced when a significant amount of money and dowry has been exchanged. Interestingly, most of you, I'm not sure if you know, but dowry is outlawed in, a, in India. So there is legislation in India. However, it's not enforced. So um, it's still a practice that exists and um, despite legislation. So we have another practice, unfortunately, within the Punjab diaspora as well as within the Indian subcontinent where there is a preference for a male child instead of a female child. So if you were to do a population health study or look at the, the gender ratio, you will find that Punjab, Haryana, there are high rates of um, female infanticide or um, more male births compared to female births. 
So this um, uh, line here is actually from the Sikret Nama, which actually is also part of our Sikh faith, that we are supposed to follow the Sikh code of conduct. And um, the key message here is that we are not meant to be associating with anyone who actually engages in gurimar or killing a female daughter. Um, one can reflect, well, how is this being implemented in contemporary society today? So, on, um, when we look at analysis, um, one thing that I, I personally feel is that if we were to look at discourse, history, and literature, or prajatics, um, we don't have I, to my knowledge, we have very few, if not limited, female preachers within the Sikh faith, despite our Sikh scriptures giving us gender equality, despite our Sikh women fighting side by side by Guru Gobind Singh Ji in the battlefield. When we hear the story about Jani Mukte, you know, Mata Bhakur was a key part of that. Guru Gobind Singh Ji's wife led the Sikh nation after Guru Gobind Singh Ji passed away. Yet that history is not captured. That history is not told. So when we understand his story, H-I-S story, we need to now have her story. We need to start to look at the feminist perspective the feminist voice. You know, who are these women in our Sikh history? Why are their stories not told? Maharani Jinda, the, her story, how she fought against the British Raj, that's only close to 100 years old. Um, I'm not sure if people, many of you have read maybe uh, Sophia, who was Maharaja Dalip Singh's daughter. She was actually part of the suffragette movement in the UK as part of the women's freedom movement. Those stories are not told. So despite women who can become priests, I'd like to ask how many of you have ever seen a female granti or gyani in the Gurdwara? Okay. okay. So yes, we play a very active role in the langur. You will see all the women in the langur. Um, but uh, all the other religious ceremonies um, and, and, you know, women, I think part of it is also to do with the training. If women and young girls are not encouraged or nurtured to go into this path, then obviously those opportunities are not going to be there. So this is just for reflection, okay? And also, within the Sikh faith, a woman can remarry, which was a key thing that the Guru Sahibs brought in um, because of the practice of sati. So... Violence against women in India. Now, as the Indian migration patterns um, become global, um, I was actually born in the UK um, and migrated to Australia back in 95, so I've lived there for about 23 years. So I'm classified as a second generation Punjabi British Sikh, but first generation Australian Sikh. Um, and so I'm assuming here in California, Canada, North America, you know, you have different waves of migration. You probably in your second, third, fourth generation of Punjabi Sikh diaspora. However, for the newly arrived migrants that come from India, um, some of these issues around violence against women in India are very prevalent. So these are some of the recent statistics. Um, and as you can see, you know, a woman is raped um, you know, murdered, um, dowry, DV cases is over 50%. So it's really important to reflect on what is happening in India and how that influences the diaspora. So because I'm from Australia, I'm just going to touch a little bit about the Australian context. So um, in the last 10 years, we've seen a huge influx of newly arrived Indian migrants, particularly very young migrants who've come under the international student migration pathway, coming at to colleges or universities to study. So typically they're in the early 20s, and then um, eventually once they get their permanent residency, they marry, go back to India and marry. So in the last 10 years, 
our um, Indian population has tripled. So we, our census does, figures don't necessarily break it down to Sikh or Punjabi, so that's why I use the term Indian, but a large proportion of our Indian population is from Punjab. So with this large increase, we've seen a lot of social issues. Um, so as a social worker, um, lots of issues around whether it's financial stress, domestic violence, mental health, um, uh, poor coping skills, um, assault, crime, we've seen the whole gamut. So in unpacking some of those issues, it's really important to understand what are the root causes of violence against women, particularly within the Indian subcontinent. And so I'm going to unpack a little bit about patriarchy, gender inequality, cultural factors, familiarism, like honour, and, and some of the dynamics of power and control. Some of my work has also involved in trying to find or look at or examine um, some of the cases that have come forward in the courts. So in the last 10 years, we, in Australia, we actually have one woman that is killed uh, due to domestic violence per week. So we have quite a high um, domestic homicide rate. In the last 10 years, these are all the Indian victims that I've been able to find that have been killed by their husbands or partners in Australia. And the ones that are highlighted in red are the Sikh women. So there's some food for thought here. Two of those cases went through to the coronial inquiry where the coroner made very specific findings into looking at how domestic violence and the death occurred for some of these women. So I'm using some of the words here quite broadly, and I understand that not everyone have holds on to these views, but this is just to sort of speak the unspoken, okay? So typically, this is just a typical situation. Um, an Indian Sikh wife may be treated like property. They have no rights. So the husband will exhibit more controlling behaviours within the marriage. So controlling behaviours can be from um, controlling the money, controlling her movements, controlling Facebook, social media, phone contact, controlling whether she can leave or move in and out of her house. Okay? Um, a lot of the Indian women that I've been supporting um, are taught from a very young age that they need to show respect to their husband, to their elders, to their in-laws. So they are raised in, in what's called a subservient way and they're not allowed to have their own opinion. And if issues arise, a lot of the women are told that this is, you need to accept this. This is your karma. This is your kismet, your destiny. So um, that victim blaming is entrenched in the cultural frame, that she is supposed to accept the violence that is happening in her marriage. And, and that it's all her fault if her husband is unhappy or the in-laws are not happy. Um, I've met quite a few women who have been forced to have an abortion against their will um, when they have found out that it's going to be a girl. So this is despite our Sikh faith telling us that we do not do this practice. Um, and, and state legislation. So now um, some of the counsellors and medical professionals they are starting to develop policies to not allow Indian couples to find out the gender. So this is what's now becoming the unintended consequence of, you could say, racial profiling if we have this practice happening in our communities. So some of the challenges. What are the challenges? We have lots of challenges. Um, Interestingly, and I, don't, I, 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 and I guess I can only draw on what's been happening in Australia, and I'm, I'm really interested to see um, you know, what's happening here in North America, but with our influx of Indian population and migration, um, our Australian government actually conducted an inquiry into dowry abuse, and the report was actually only just tabled on the 14th of February, two days ago. So that was great, so I got to read that. So we have 12 recommendations. Um, as part of that inquiry, um, 
I personally prepared a very detailed submission and gave evidence to that inquiry. Um, I was able to pull together the case studies from the victims that I've supported to actually look at, well, how does dowry abuse occur within the context of domestic and family violence? So dairy-related abuse is not an isolated issue, okay? Okay, one minute. <laughs> okay, I'll try to rush through. Um, we're wanting it to be recognised as one of the forms of abuse of um, including, you know, physical, emotional, sexual, but, but to be counted as financial abuse. So these are some of the examples, lavish weddings, groom, uh, gold, cash, um, those um, grooms who have citizenship, they can demand a very large dowry. We're talking about 50,000, 100,000 Australian dollars, so very large amounts of money. Um, so what can we do to prevent that? So I know I'm, I'm going to rush to the end part of it because um, part of it is to upskill professionals to build their capacity to understand how to work with the Indian communities in understanding the cultural issues. Um, the second part is around community education. So when we look at primary prevention, we want to educate our community that particularly living in Australia or Western countries, um, you know, domestic violence is not accepted. So there's laws in place, but also understanding that dairy is not an accepted part within the Western culture. Um, advocacy, so you know, highlighting those issues, whether it's at a ministerial level, whether it's in a research level, um, those are critical issues. Um, so one of the things that we've done, we've set up a, a women's domestic violence refuge, which was the first one um, that services Indian women in Australia, um, and that's done with the support of the Brisbane Sikh Gurdwara, um, and we provide emergency accommodation, welfare support, <coughs> counselling. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. So my final point, women's rights are human rights. So the role of a Sikh is to help others and serve others. Sikhs have always fought for social justice and oppression and human rights. And our Sikh gurus gave us gender equality over 550 years ago. And I want you to think about, well, what's happening in 2019? And why do we see such high rates of violence against women? We need to change that need to change the statistics, need to challenge the patriarchy, awaken the community, empower the women to live free from violence. Okay, thank you.